Hi guys, we are having a solar podcast today with Dan McCabe from GI Energy from Brisbane, but GI Energy also installs in other parts of the country and we'll find out more about it from Dan. Hi Dan, you're not uh, new in the solar industry, you're one of the pioneering kind of guys. Uh, how did you start? Yeah, a long time ago now in um, a quite a new industry, obviously. Um, back in 2009, was my first experience in the solar industry. So I guess you could call me a veteran now. Um, started off working for a company who was a LED lighting firm, but they wanted to do a little bit of solar. So that was my first experience. Companies that we worked with back then that were installing solar panels were um, quite difficult to, to work with. A lot of cowboys around. Um, some of the installs that we were inspecting were, um, were just dreadful, to be honest. And um, I learned a lot in that period and um, spoke to lots of different companies trying to find different people that could work with us. And um, it was really hard to find somebody reputable. Prices were all over the place. One guy was charging 10 grand for the same thing. Another guy was charging 24. So while we're doing all this research, um, as I say, I learned a lot of what not to do. And um, fast forward a few years and in, in, in 2011, obviously GI Energy was born and, and the... Um, the core principle of the business was to be very ethical in terms of its approach to dealing with clients and offer them um, a very good value service, not necessarily a cheap service, but a very good value service and make sure that they're really well looked after. And, and I saw that as a, a gap in the market because there wasn't much of that happening back then. And I think um, a reflection of that today is how many companies have, have been and gone in that relatively short space of time. Um, we're one of the oldest serving solar specific companies in the country now, certainly one of the first CEC accredited um, solar um, companies in, in the country. So um, that's how I got started and that's how we intend to continue. Yeah, I think over 800 companies come and gone and you survived it all because you've given good service. I read somewhere 2.2 years was the average lifespan of a solar company in Australia. That was a couple of years ago. Things might have changed, mm. but... Um, We've obviously been been here since 2011 and um, the future is bright for us. And, and I think that's just because we, the whole culture in the company is customer first, not margin first. If you come to one of our management meetings, you won't hear us talk about cost cutting and increasing profits. You'll hear us talking about ways to innovate, create more savings, create more value for customers. And um, everybody right from myself to my business partner, to our general manager through to the sales staff, the installers, everybody buys into that culture. And um, that's why we've been so well reviewed and, and been able to, as you say, trade through all those times. Um, and also, we believe we have a, a bright future because of that too. Mm. So would you get a lot of repeat customers then? We do. Um, we get lots of referrals. We're probably not very good at actively pursuing referrals, if I'm, uh, referrals, if I'm honest. We don't have a great referral scheme but we get a lot naturally, which is a nice um, a nice way to get them. You don't hunt the customers down. You actually give them the space to come in their own time. Yeah, we do. And and we, we, we probably could do a bit more hunting, if I'm honest, and not in a, you know, um, pressurized way, but we could probably improve that part of the business. But the fact that we get as many as we do, I think is, is just because we look after people in the long term and consultants and installers will check in with customers they uh, feel comfortable coming back to us with questions and queries. Mm. And mm. then I think once you've, there's been some touch points after they've paid their invoice, naturally, not necessarily related to an issue, but related to just checking in, um, it's more likely to come up at a dinner party and um, you're more likely to get referrals. So I don't know what we, this year, at one point we had almost 40% referred business. Wow. Um, and for us commercially now, Basically, 100% is referred. We do no commercial advertising at all. Mm, mm. Excellent. So basically, you started in 2011. So you've been around more than a decade, many, many systems installed. What makes GI Energy stand out from any other company that maybe just started two or three years ago? I think not to sound too corny and, and repetitive, but I think it is just that that genuine belief that we should care about our clients. And, and when you when you believe that and when that's how you operate your business, I think that does set you aside a little bit in terms, certainly for referrals, but also just in 
the first time anybody picks up the phone to speak to a potential customer. Um, the training history obviously is a good USP for us as well. We were the 57th company to be a CC approved retailer and number one to 56. A lot of them are gone now. So that gives us a bit of credibility. We also do a lot of work for publicly listed companies, uh, councils and governments. So we've got some people there on our client list that do a lot of due diligence. So if you have a a commercial or even a residential customer that's got a few quotes, which is pretty typical now for this industry. Some people have seven or eight quotes and you're able to say to them, don't just look how my mouth moves, look at where my feet have been. <laughs> and you can give them references from really credible sources that have clearly spent a lot of money on due diligence. Mm. I think that makes people feel comfortable. So I think it's it's trade in history. It's 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 the, the customer care um, and um, the credible client list. Um, and we, I mean, we can talk about products, honestly, anyone can install any product now. We don't have exclusive rights to anything innovative. It's more just about the core of the company and the way we look after people. The way you come across today, it seems to be it's coming right from the top, that attitude. Yeah. And I think it has to be genuine. I think if you go to somebody's website and you, everybody's going to say similar things probably to what I'm saying today. I care for my customer. Yeah, and I think you can even in written form, unless you've got a very good copywriter, you can. A lot of people can subconsciously understand whether or not it's sincere, mm. but um, you can't fake that on a phone call or a sales meeting or an install. You you have to mean it, and it's that's the difference. Mm. Mm. Okay, what services do you provide nowadays? Outside of typical solar energy? Well, just, yeah, at GI Energy, what services do you do? Residential solar, commercial? I see. Yeah, so, yeah, cl residential um, systems, um, commercial systems behind the meter up to a megawatt is a sweet spot for us. Uh, mostly rooftop, some ground mounts, lots of batteries. Um, we also install power management systems for commercial customers who have load issues with EVs or air cons. Um, we can install reasonably sophisticated power management systems to, to help that without increasing capacity from the grid. Um, and then obviously EV charges are becoming more popular and things like that. So what that means is that basically some companies, if they would turn all the microwaves off at, on at the same time, then their power supply isn't big enough. But if they stagger it with software, then basically they can potentially avoid very expensive upgrades and your company does have that expertise. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a quick example is um, we work with a company on the Gold Coast who just couldn't get any more from the grid um, and it would have cost them an unreasonable amount of money. It wasn't possible, basically. Um, so what we've, and they needed air cons for warehousing and for extra office space. <clears throat> so rather than not have the air cons, we've increased their solar system size. They're about 200 kilowatts on the roof now and we're probably going to do more. Um, and then you install power management and prioritize the load. So you could have, I think they had nine air cons and this one ramps down first, then this one, then this one. So you could have the one in the director's office go off last <laughs> if that's what he wanted. Um, <laughs> no, 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 can... no. That one is not needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let him sweat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they go down in increments. So I think we did that 25% increments. So, rather, so if there's no solar energy and no grid power, you're not going to trip anything. Mm -hmm. And it's going to manage the power. And that the aircon is an easy example, but EVs is another obvious one. You've got a high rise building with a thousand people in, and now 10% want EV charges. It just can't happen. So that's where the power management stuff comes in. Right. And we can, we'd custom design and build those, and, um, and then obviously go and install them. Mm. So have you got uh, electrical? Uh qualifications and your staff I wonder what are the accreditations myself personally no I, I, I my background was that I left school very very young and um, I left England um, when I was 21 I think and um, I just learned on the job um, I don't get involved with the technical stuff but there's uh, engineers with us that do the power management and then obviously solar energy CC designers that, that do that design right yeah okay now um Brisbane, I believe, with all the sunshine, etc., is probably one of the best places in the world to go solar and battery. Can you explain why? Yeah, I mean, I guess you just hit the nail on the head there. It comes down to the sunshine days, right? <laughs> I mean, we're um, we're here in Sydney today, and um, I was brave enough to just take my jacket off for a minute. 
in Brisbane, it doesn't get cold and you get lots of sunshine. It's really that simple. And, and obviously there's some places, if you go to Cloncurry um, and um, Darwin, places like that, you get that little bit extra, but that's pretty rare. If you compare Brisbane, Queensland, generally to most places in the world, the, um, the peak sunshine hours in a day are, are very, very high. Um, and we've got good roofs too. So that's something people don't think about when we, you know, when you look at roofs in Melbourne, they're typically a bit smaller, lots of terracotta. Um, Brisbane, there's um, a higher concentration of larger tin or tile roofs that um, you can fit bigger systems on. Yeah, so yeah. Queensland's a, Queensland generally and Brisbane is, is a great spot for good solar production. Sydney is very pretty homes with a lot of higgledy pickly roofs and gables yeah. and you try to fit a solar panel in between. Yeah. So you're lucky in the Brisbane widest area that you've got those big roofs. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, good yeah. for solar. Now, um, sometimes you being the boss, maybe you had a sales guy who misread the meter. They come out on site. Now suddenly there's a $400 extra cost because you guys didn't work it out. Do you going to try and trick the customer into paying it or what's the story there? I mean, <clears throat> to try and trick someone to do it, definitely not. I think those, those sort of things are, um, it depends on the situation. If we're talking about a residential home, then usually if there was an upgrade that we've missed, then uh, that's on us. Um if it's if a yeah, I guess if a, I, I'm simply saying maybe it's a three phase but or two phase, okay. and he thought it was a single phase, and he picked the wrong inverter, and the three phase model is a bit more expensive, that kind of thing. Well, if you walked into my office, you'd see that I've got two big Fijian clubs in there that I bought from Fiji years ago, <laughs> two big carvings. So I guess the sales guy would be introduced into one of those. Oh come on, no, 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 you, you're not allowed to say that nowadays. <clears throat> Politically, very incorrect. Sorry, you're not meaning that, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. Although it would be nice, but no, it's um. I get look. If it's not the customer's fault, then um, then it's our fault, isn't it? I guess, mm, and it yeah. does happen mm. uh, from time to time. Fortunately, we've got good processes in place to 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 double and triple check those things. So mm. we're not coming across that often, but yeah, it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you take responsibility. hundred percent. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, they say if it's done again, it's a stuff up. If it's done only once, it's a training exercise. Yeah. It's an education, isn't it? <laughs> Hopefully a $400 education is not too bad. If it's, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Some staff comes and re-educate themselves many times. They do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anyway, um, how important is after-sale service with solar? I mean, it's it's a panel. It doesn't move. It just sits there. You just whack it on. Isn't that the game? No. So our, our after-sales process is that our consultant who speaks to the customer, whether that be on the phone or face-to-face, um, -face, however that interaction has happened, once the install is complete, we'd usually give it a few weeks, depending on the area, maybe a bit longer, depending on how long the meter takes to change. Mm -hmm. So that process is completely complete. We um, we would always touch base with them. <clears throat> it would always be the same person that, that initially spoke to them. Mm. And um, it basically just make sure that they understand everything because there's sometimes quite a long period of time from a deposit being taken or an order being signed till that completion of the meter changeover. So it can be helpful to just rehash things. From there, you know, we do bill reviews for people all the time. I've obviously been doing this for a while. We get customers that have been installed 10 years ago will um, email us a bill and say, can you just check this for me? Something doesn't seem right. And um, the after-sales service is, is very important. Commercially, it's different. Again, it's more important again. So commercially, we don't ever install a, a panel inverter, send an invoice and never speak to customers again. We're creating a, we believe we're creating a long-term relationship with the client there. Um, same as homes, but even more so for commercial. And um, we, we touch base with our commercial clients all the time, mm. make sure their sister's co system is correctly maintained. Sometimes we do the maintenance, sometimes we don't, that's up to them. But um, to make sure that it's working correctly and to make sure that they're um, aware of any changes that are happening mm. and mm. Um, any innovative technology they might be able to benefit from. So we we see that relationship with commercial customers as a, a very much an ongoing relationship and we see ourselves as an energy management partner for them, not a solar installer. So um, once that last invoice has been paid, 
it's definitely not the end of the relationship for us, whether it be a two kilowatt system on a home or a megawatt system on a roof. Oh, excellent. Now, you, because you've gone since 2011, in, in those days we installed one and a half kilowatt systems, sometimes two. Yeah. Do you get customers now who need upgrades? Is that happening more and more? We do. A lot of them from us, but also probably more so people that um, have solar that, that doesn't work well anymore. Unfortunately, the, the company that installed for them is no longer contactable. So we get a lot of people contact us just through Google searches or however the, 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 the customer comes through to us with systems that uh, either need to be replaced, repaired, a lot of them replaced, unfortunately, little one and a half kilowatt systems, two kilowatt systems that are no longer either working or working for them in terms of producing enough power. Mm. Um, so yeah, we do. We get a lot of those. And I think that trend will continue to increase significantly. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of poor quality solar installed. And um, over the years, I've learned myself by sometimes choosing in the early days some products that I wish I hadn't as well. So I'm not sitting here today saying I'm perfect. But we have stood by those issues when they have occurred. Others haven't. No, um, that's why 800 companies have closed their doors and decided to run when the product failed yeah. and they didn't want to be there and support the customer. So you being there for more than a decade shows your customer support is rock strong. We had an incident with a manufacturer many years ago. I won't name names. Um, they're no longer around anyway. And um, I was obviously a lot newer in this would have been probably 2000. 13, maybe, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and I was um, sold by the manufacturer and by the distributor that they were a really good product. I genuinely believe they were. Long story short, we installed a lot of them, and um, there was water ingress issues with basically every panel, um, and um, they disappeared, and the distributor disappeared. So then, obviously, under Australian consumer law, and also just from a you know an ethical perspective, you, you, you're the one that looks after people. And um, we were a much smaller business then. That was a very difficult thing to work through financially. Because and, um, basically the buck has now stopped with you. You recommended the <clears> gear. <throat> yeah. You were let down by the distributor. You were let down by the manufacturer. Yeah. But you wanted to continue with that customer relationship. So you put your hand in your pocket yeah. and paid for it. Yeah. And oh, there was a lot. Very unusual in this industry. Like usually people run. Well, you spoke earlier about education and, and, and paying for an education. <laughs> I certainly paid for one then. So now since then, um, we do a lot more due diligence in terms of the products that we use and the suppliers that they come from and the way that they're installed. So I think um, the value that the end customer gets out of that education that I paid for um, that they might not realize with working with someone that's been in the industry for quite a while is um, ultimately saving them more money and giving them a system that's more reliable. Mm. So um, it was a horrible time. It was stressful, and but we worked through it, and um, there wasn't a customer that, that, that missed out. And uh, I'm quite proud of that mm. because mm. Um, it was difficult, and it, because we didn't have much trading history then, to be honest, it would have been quite easy to close down and start up again. That seems to be what a lot of people do here. And it's amazing to me that that's legal, you know, not naming companies again, but there was one in Brisbane just recently, um, quite a reputable company from the outside looking in. They were went out of business and left a lot of people, a lot of debt there, and then um, opened up with a almost identical name. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what how they're doing D different now. Different ABN. Different ABN. I, I don't even know if they changed offices. Mm. So um, that to me is should be criminal, but anyway, it's not. Mm. But I didn't want to do that. No, no. You know, I can sleep well at night. So GI Energy stands for great integrity. <laughs> it could do, it should do maybe. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's green incentives actually is the is the yeah. acronym. But it was yeah we we rebranded <laughs> to sound a little bit when we started doing commercial. We thought. Mm. GI energy sounded better <laughs> than green incentives. <laughs> well, you, I think you explained in the past it's actually standing for our integrity. <laughs> great, yeah. Great yeah. integrity. Yeah, there you go. Maybe we'll change it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um, you know, you've just told about the product. I mean, there's there's more expensive product that does tend to last a bit longer. Tesla batteries, for example, really good product. But can you still stuff it up in the install even if you have really good product? Absolutely, you can. And also, one thing that people probably don't realize is you can save a lot of money installing things differently. But if it's not installed correctly, often your warranties won't stand. 
So, but you only find out when the when, when, when it's you... too late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yes, you can definitely stay. You can get the best panel, the best inverter, and install it incorrectly, and still have it not function properly, and also have void warranties. No question. Mm. Um, I know yeah. a couple of good tricks how to make it a bit cheaper in the install. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you put a few less less. Uh, Tire clamps or something like that, you know. Just you <laughs> yeah. save you save money there. Yeah. You use plastic cable ties instead of the steel ones. They do block your gutter five years later, but you're gone. Mm. Um, my my love of silicon, of everything, you know. Stick it down with silicon; that'll fix everything for the next three years. How do you like my method of installing? Should I be working for you? I think you just described the job we just audited <laughs> on the, actually on in the central coast. Basically, just that. Conduit running everywhere on a roof that should have had metal cable tray. And it actually would have saved them a lot of money because it was long cable runs, but it's not been in long and there's exposed cable everywhere. And yeah, they've um, they've they've drilled straight into a clip lock roof sheet to put saddles down. It's a it's a mess. It would have saved them a lot of money, but actually that system's it's about two hundred and ten kilowatts. And um, I think it's gonna have to come down and start again. There's some hail damage, which is why we we're up there, but it's um, it's a mess. And the owner would have no idea, would they? He knew it wasn't performing well, but the company that installed it weren't responsive. Mm. And um, even after the damage that was caused by storms, they didn't want to come out and help to inspect. And um, funnily enough, we'd quoted them to install that job originally, and we missed out on price. <laughs> so, um, so they're paying twice. <laughs> I think they are, yeah. I, th I don't know how that transaction is going to happen in terms of insurance and, and whatnot, but it's um, mm. it's messy and I feel for the guy and hopefully we can help him. But it's um, basically all the things that you just mentioned there in jest and more have been done. And this is a this is a commercial system, so you would expect there should be more compliance checks. A higher level of, yeah. And a higher level of personnel involved, mm. but unfortunately there isn't. In fact, it's probably more messy on that end because there's a lot more engineering intricacies that people don't consider. They don't evaluate existing infrastructure properly. Mm. Um, they give just the absolute basic must-have drawings to get approved and then subcontract the work to someone who is basically on their own installing, and um, it can be very messy. I find it always very difficult when um, customers... Uh, give the job to a company and then they subcontract it to one that subcontracts it again right. and, and you're five miles removed from actually who's you're hired in the first place. Do you use that system? No, we don't. Um, we do use subcontractors to install and um, – I think, a but lot you of, don't let them subcontract it to others no, again. No, and no, no, and and you lose quality control there. So I think with the the subcontractor versus installer versus hired installer, a lot of people in the industry, I think, look down on people that in, use subcontractors because they don't believe that you can install a system as well. I completely disagree with that. I think there's pros and cons of both. I don't think that there's one way that is necessarily better than the other. Mm. I think it has to be manage correctly and, and the correct quality control needs to be in place before engaging somebody and then also after they're in, installed for you. And you could argue that there's a lot of benefits there. One of the things that I often say to people that I really believe is most of the best installers, not all, most of the best installers work for themselves because they're typically people that are a little bit more dedicated don't mind working a bit longer and harder, sometimes have a little bit more passion. And um, that's why they end up being a, a contractor in the first place rather than an employee. So you've just got to find them. So there's a big difference between going, taking your job to the lowest bidder and just letting them install for you versus seeking out really good people, doing your due diligence before engaging with them, and doing audits after they've installed for you to make sure that that quality control is there. And um, that's our business model. And I would argue until I was blue in the teeth to, um, to say Until you got the color of your T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we are, but what you were suggesting before that you there's a chain of contractors involved, you could lose complete control of the job then. And um, we would definitely never do that. 
And most of the guys that install for us now, some of them have been installing for us for a decade. Um, and they don't typically install for other people either. So, um, so you know yeah. their quality, you know how they work, and they also know what you expect. Pretty much, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and you mm. do have to find new ones from time to time, of mm. course. Mm. Mm. Because, um, but that's also another, in my opinion, that, that's a benefit. If you had a system installed, let's say you were in a slightly rural area mm. and you wanted to use a, a local guy, man in a van type situation, which is completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that model. There's more of a chance that he would leave town or potentially go out of business or change trades and not have backup support for you. If we're using a contractor in that rural location and they leave town or go out of business, we're the primary contract holder. So you've got some security there in layers. And we do always make sure that we have install and maintenance independently so that let's say that exact situation happens and then the day, the next day after that guy leaves town, your system has a failure. You're still going to have support there from a maintenance team. And um, I think that's a selling point, not a... That's negative. true, but there are other companies who are large companies who come into accounts like uh, grasshoppers, put 10 systems on, oh, yeah. leave and never come back. Yeah. So it's actually your ethics mm. and your willingness to support customer in the long run that makes the difference in the company because yeah. there are big companies who just rub their hands and move on. Yeah. I think what they're doing is very opportunistic in terms of they see that probably as easy marketing. So because it's a less competitive area for sometimes door knocking, mm -hmm. telemarketing, that seems to be a typical way of doing what you're suggesting. They'll come through town and they'll do exactly that. They'll install, then they'll go to the next, then the next, then the next. But then they just, they have no intention of ever coming back there. Whereas if we're installing a, a rural area, it's our area for, we're not coming and going. Mm. We're there for a decade or more. Like it's, um, so it's a very different way of doing things. And, um, and I don't think there's, in terms of employing people as well, I said before, the best installers often work for themselves. I'm not suggesting that you can't employ and train really good installers either. Mm, mm, I just mm. don't think there's necessarily one way is better than the other. And I think sometimes in this industry, it, you're looked upon as a less quality company if you have subcontractors. And I don't think there could be anything further from the truth. I just think that you have to manage it properly. I think if you pick your subcontractors by the cheapest price, you can be in trouble. But if you pick your subcontractors and then audit the job and there's a great outcome, there's no reason you shouldn't give them another job. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Now, you've got over a decade experience in solar. What are kind of your golden three, four, five tips to end customers who are now looking at solar, and not just solar only, but even maybe solar and batteries? For someone starting out their journey now, um, I think the number one thing is do, do your research, obviously, get yourself more than one quote. Um, but don't get too bogged down in the detail. Find a company that you trust <clears throat> because you can sit there all day long analyzing the different data sheets and technical differences of products and trying to become a solar expert. We see this all the time. People go so far down the rabbit hole that they get themselves into analysis paralysis. It becomes exhausting. It huh? becomes exhausting. It becomes a job. And, and often they won't do anything and then they'll get their bill and then they'll review it. So if I was given advice to a very good friend of mine who was looking to just start out in solar, uh, to buy a solar system, and I didn't have a solar company anymore, my advice to him would be to get two quotes, maybe three at the most. Don't go and get eight or nine quotes. Obviously, have a look at the products, do a bit of research, but focus on the company. Find someone that you can trust before you go down the rabbit hole of products. Anyone can install different products. That's not where the value is. The value is finding someone that's going to look after you from the first point of contact to five years later, if you have an issue, 10 years later, if you have an issue. So find somebody that you can trust. And that has a track record of having supported their customers in the past, which you do get if you have been around for a decade. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, mm. Um, and then work out that you're happy with them. And then if you've got questions about products, do that part then. Mm. Um, and make sure that they can install different things for you as well. I think if someone's saying, 
this is the best panel and they're saying this one's really bad and that inverter's really bad. I think as soon as you hear someone that's really slating stuff and pushing their product offering really hard, it's usually because they've got a warehouse full of that type of product. And it might be a good product, but not, it's not one size fits all. The right panel and inverter is different for every customer. So you should be getting advice that is, we can talk about products and if you really like something, well, you can have it. I'm going to be honest with you about the pros and cons mm. of that panel or inverter. But if um, if that's what you want, that's what we'll install. But let's look at the company first. And mm. Mm. and then if you want to talk about temperature coefficiency ratings and how many bus bars panels have and the type of cells and all of that stuff, that's fine. We can do that as well. But um, if you're doing that with three or four different companies or some people, seven or eight different companies, Everyone's just going to be pushing these little unique selling points and you're going to get so confused. So it's bring it back to basics and go back to finding a company that you trust and then ask the right questions to that mm. company and do your research. Don't just take it for granted that they're telling you the truth. Mm. It's the amount of times that we've spoken to people that have had German solar systems installed and they're not or that have got a warranty that doesn't exist and they've been promised warranties. Just make sure that what you're being told is correct. Even if it is somebody that's really likable and that you feel you can trust, just take 10 minutes and look up their ABN. Mm. Find out if what they're telling you is true. How long they've been around. Yeah. How long they've been around. Mm. Um, You know, yeah, their accreditation, licensing, Mm. all that easy stuff. So look, I'll throw my own thinking into it as well. But basically what you're saying is check the company out because that's your journey for the next 10, 15, 20 years. I would also add to it that if it's really, really cheap, they can't actually support the 10, 15, 25 year warranty. Nobody's going to sit on a phone by making 40 bucks profit mm. and waiting 25 years for your phone call. Now, because solar can return $2,000 or so per year on a residential system, even a $2,000 cost difference for better gear only means you're sitting there for one year extra to get your money back. And your payback might be going from three and a half years to four years, four and a half. But why be greedy? You yeah. get a 25-year benefit waiting one year for the better company and the better system. So my key advice is do not go for the cheap stuff because what they've done is they bought fake Google reviews. Yeah. They're using gear that's crap, but they're building it up as if it's good. And when you need help down the track, your system will be down for six months before anybody comes, if anybody comes. Yeah. Am I kind of having that? Yeah, it's a false economy, isn't it? I think we worked out once that the uh, on a 6.6 kilowatt system, by doing some of the things that you mentioned earlier, cutting corners on install, you could save $600 on an install cost alone plus GST. Hmm. Um, and that's just on labor and minor materials that aren't even listed on a quote. Things like circuit breakers, cables. Um, all just the use a really thin cable. Who cares if it Little gets hit like hot, that. hot every time? It all adds up and then saving time also, you know, just putting the panels where it suits you, not the customer, that type of thing. And mm. we're obviously talking about Brisbane solar and solar production before, but if even in Australia, the re- anywhere in Australia, the return on investment is phenomenal. You don't have to cut corners and make it too cheap because you will, it sounds cheesy, but you will pay twice. Do it properly once and... Um, the, it's a much better overall value proposition and, and investment. And, um, yeah, we get so frustrated with some of the stuff that you're talking about. Obviously, we will come used to the term the solar coaster now. It really is true. And um, you just feel for customers that get tricked by it because you know they're going to they're gonna end up paying more in the long run. Nowadays, I mean, the olden days, you just put solar on. But now it's kind of like a much more long-term relationship. Yeah. Can you explain? Yeah, I guess there's a lot more technology. So years ago, you used to have a a power bill with a rate per kilowatt hour, and that was it. Now, in most areas, you get peak demand charges on on home bills. That's a different challenge to overcome. Um, So it means that you might install a solar system now. In a few years' time, you might need something else. It might be because of those peak demand charges. It might be because you buy an electric vehicle. It's an evolving thing. As your family grows or gets smaller, you might need to change things. So um, it is. So an you might pick a battery. You might want a heat pump. You yeah. might want an EV charger. So these are all services that you supply. Yeah, correct. And you might also want to do things a little bit more intelligently as things change, mm. as more technology becomes available. Mm. One of the um, 
Uh, we install intelligent relays so that will <clears throat> you can basically divert power into hot water or into other appliances. Mm, mm, mm. Um, that's more important now than ever because your feed-in tariff is going down and down and down. And um, So you basically during the day, you really want to now use that solar to heat your water, yeah. pre-cool your home, um, fill your battery. Yes. And and you give advice on all of that? You do, do device, hardware and software. So you set everything up for people so mm. that not their solar system is going to work effectively for them rather than just a system that is producing power and it will produce power when it produces power. And if you use it, you use it. If not, you sell it back to the grid. That's the standard solar system. So you can install additional technology now that is more intelligent, that will send power where it's needed, when it's needed. And that is evolving all the time. Mm. So that's why it's an ongoing relationship because you want to be part of that evolution and you want to save more money. And who knows what energy retailers and wholesalers and, um, are going to do in the future. We don't know how those charges are going to... The EV thing is uh, as soon as more people start buying electric vehicles, I don't think general consumers realize how much of a problem that is for Australia. So there's going to be... In additional... terms of the grid being sufficient enough, et cetera. So Correct. you really yeah. got to make your own house... Uh, energy policy proof. <laughs> you do. And a good you know, example, in where I live in Brisbane, there were so many power cuts this summer and there weren't last summer. And the reason for that is on those really hot days, everybody's coming home and turning on their air cons. Everybody's buying bigger air cons every year for a start. But now in the little concentration where I am and then where these other transformers didn't cope, there's probably 10% more people have got electric vehicles. So we had power cuts well, I think we pro we're in a very built-up suburb, about five kilometers from the CBD, and we had probably five power cuts. And when you go on the Energex um, website for the outage finder, it has a little red dot on the outages. I've got some screenshots still on my phone. There was loads of them. That didn't happen last year, but it's going to happen more often because people are going to – and the government will push the EV agenda – not to get political, but, you know, they'll subsidize and, and suggest people go and buy EVs. And there's obviously reasons they're doing that. But they're not looking at the bigger picture. So if everybody tomorrow came home with an EV, what do you think could happen? We all need to buy a solar system and a big battery to protect ourselves from the blackouts. And that's where you need things like intelligent home automation systems built into your renewable energy so that you can charge your car at the correct time, your air cons you know, it can come on before you get home potentially to cool mm, your house mm, down. Mm, your mm. pool pump only comes on if there's power, you know, to run it, and then you can prioritize that too. So your pool's not, not going to not come on, but it's mm. going to come on when it needs to. Mm, mm. And at the very last order of priority, it will come on if there's no solar energy. So it still comes on, mm. things like that. So it's just being more smart with the way that you produce, use, and control your energy overheads. Wow. And that's why it's a long-term relationship. Now, the next two to five years, we probably do see a lot of changes with EVs. What do you think specifically EVs will do for solar and battery purchases? I think from our point of view, it will drive them up. I think we'll see a lot more people understand why batteries are important. I think a lot of people at the moment still are um, a little bit hesitant with batteries because it's newer technology um, and they're more comfortable with the solar system. But I think it will just become almost every system will be installed with batteries, and and an EV will be a big reason for that. It's um, yes, I mean, it or not. if if you can drive the EV for free, literally out of your solar power, yeah, with the help of the battery and with direct charging from solar, there's two and a half grand or so you save each year on petrol cost alone. That exactly. can go towards purchasing your battery. Exactly, and then all of a sudden, when you start quantifying it that way. The return on investment, financial return on investment, is um, is actually quite good. Yeah, it's four or five years. You can actually at the moment a battery could be seven, eight years with yeah. VPPs maybe down a bit. But by the time you start looking at the EV and the petrol cost and throw that back into the ROI, mm. you actually it's a no-brainer because plus you get the backup uh, support in case there's a blackout or brownout yeah. and invite your neighbours over for a cocktail while they're sitting in the dark. It was actually really nice when our power went out. We didn't have aircon on. <clears throat> we have a, a battery that um, doesn't support three phase and, and we didn't want to have aircon on a battery anyway because we only have 13 and a half kilowatt hours of storage. Mm -hmm. But um, we still had ceiling fans. We still had TVs on. I've got a three-year-old at home, so we were able to 
have lights on and ceiling fans for him and TV. It was just, it was really nice to have that power. And um, on the app, it tells you how long you've got if you keep everything on the way it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could basically just get on with your, your, your night and day as you normally would, just without air com. That mm, was all. Mm, mm. And um, as you sort of peer out your window and no one else's lights are on and yours are, <laughs> it's quite a nice feeling. Um, uh, he's not bragging to the neighbours. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're, if you're his neighbour, he wasn't bragging. He right. actually thought if you would have wanted to, you could have knocked on the door and you could have come over. Absolutely, yeah. Maybe they could have bought a battery off me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just invite them all for a dinner party and yeah. use it as a sales Yeah, meeting. why not do a little conference? <laughs> <laughs> Great. I understand your company does more than just install solar. You actually got some uh, sponsorship project going with Cambodia. Can you explain that? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, many years ago, I went to Cambodia with my girlfriend at the time. That was my first time there. And um, I come from, uh, I was actually born in South Africa and, and we were um, in an area in South Africa that was uh, a little bit less affluent, let's say. So I I'd seen a lot of stuff in the past and I'd traveled to lots of emerging nations, but Cambodia really struck a chord with me for some reason. There was the way that the people lived there um, once you went off the beaten track was uh, was quite sad, but also quite heartwarming because they were people that had had the least but wanted to give the most. Um, and without going too far into the story, I, I knew, ended up knowing a few local people over there. So it wasn't just going to the tourist trap restaurant kind of thing. We were going into their homes and, um, yeah, they wanted to give the most. They're very warm people and it left an impression on me. So when I left, I, I wanted to create a not-for-profit that would um, help them in some way. And um, it got procrastinated a lot, to be honest. It took a long time to do anything about it because I was trying to create this really big impact organization and that was probably a little bit overwhelming while trying to run a business as well so um ultimately what ended up happening was we created the the, the cambodia not-for-profit within our own business and what we do there is supply and we supply small solar and battery systems with some basic electrical appliances in homes and then we have um there's local people there that will install them so if something goes wrong they have support on the ground there's they're, they're trained to install and service so it's a very small solar system the homes are um, are very small it's usually one living area and then two separate rooms that are segregated by a dwarf wall it's not you know completely secluded um, they're raised off the ground so if it floods water can come beneath and that's it they're very small probably four meters by four meters something like that but um, so they don't need a lot, but we put a ceiling fan in, mobile phone charger, obviously battery, um, and a light. So when kids come home, they can do homework under a light and a fan. Parents can charge a mobile phone, which is massive because you can connect there. You can get 4G, probably mm. 5G now. Um, so we work directly with a charity there called VBC. That's how the partnership works. I've been over there myself and built the homes that I'm talking about that I know them very well. Um, and uh, it's our little way of giving something back. So when, depending on how we're structuring things, I think this year we've done 40 homes. Um, so that makes a big impact on, on people's lives. Now they can, it helps with sanitation as well so that it makes them healthier. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually quite cost effective to do. It's, uh, we can power a home in Cambodia for $270, which when you think about that, that's not a lot of money. No, but really. The, but you're really making a difference. Now I've got a new way to describe GI energy here. <laughs> Great initiative. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we might have to try and use that one somewhere too. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a throughout the podcast, we're gonna, you know, I'm coming up with different uh, acronyms here. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll write them down. <laughs> yeah, copyright, mate. <laughs> All right. Um Anything on the personal level, stories where you walk in and somebody really got done by crap solar and you go, oh, my God, how am I going to tell them? You know, I've had situations where somebody was sold maybe a $5,000 verse system for 20000 and you feel you can't even even tell them mm -hmm. because they still believe it was German this and German that and no, it wasn't, but it had a German-sounding name. Yeah. Do you have situations like that where you really go, oh, well, how do I communicate this now? Definitely loads of them over the years 
it's unfortunately usually people that are a bit more vulnerable for one reason or another, <clears throat> not to pigeonhole, but it could be an older person, a single person, something like that, someone that's been probably targeted um, and they'll phone or they'll come in to the office or they'll make contact with us and they'll say, oh, I bought a solar system and I've just got my bill and it's really high. I don't know why. And I bought the best gear. I bought German panels, German inverter, but I've rang the people that installed it for me and there's no answer. Or even worse, I've rang them and they've said they're coming and they haven't. And I've rang them again. And I, and um, often you can hear in their voice that they're stressed about it. And then you, when you do the research into what they've got installed, it's usually not a, a German solar system. And often they have paid a lot of money for it. And sometimes it has to come down. Just to be fair, a lot of stuff is now made in China. Mm. But actually, there is good quality stuff made in China, just like the iPhone is made in China. So yeah. we're not kind of picking a particular company. But no. German was usually in the olden days, especially, yeah. the top of the range. And so some manufacturers decided to put German names on their product to indicate it was German when it wasn't. Yeah, and That's what we're talking about. Definitely. And there were even whole companies. Again, I won't name names, but there were, there were whole companies that called themselves things that made them sound European mm. or sound German. Mm. Uh, there were even solar panels that were – there was an acronym that was um, that made them sound like they're uh, manufactured here in Australia mm. and they weren't. But you're right. There's nothing wrong with Chinese equipment. Most of the stuff that is in your home now comes from China and, and the iPhone's a great we're, example. We're talking electrical gear. Electrical gear yeah. and not even just electrical. But, yeah, most 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 things are. Actually I mean, true. Your, your plastic buckets, anything you buy from Bunnings pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean <laughs> – I don't know what the percentage would be, but I'd say if you walk through a Bunnings store, 70, 80% of what you buy is, is probably come from a factory in China. Mm -hmm. And there's a very good percentage of that that's really good. <clears throat> but the difference is if something comes from China, you tell someone that's where it comes from. And mm -hmm. you explain to them that there's a difference between a good quality product and a poor quality product from that country. But under these circumstances, when that customer contacts you, often they've been told it is from, and Germany is an easy one because, as you said, Germany has always been associated with precision engineering mm. and quality workmanship. So people have leaned on that. And uh, even now you get German engineered products. What does that really mean? There's one engineer in Germany and then a factory with 30,000 people in China. <laughs> so you have to be careful. And you feel, and that person's obviously been told you're paying for the best. Now their system's failed and sometimes they are a more vulnerable person and um, it's horrible. It's really horrible. But um, it's too late. All you can do is break the news gently to them. I mean, yeah, I don't know. You certainly wouldn't tell them that they'd been conned or you, you'd break it gently and explain to them that it's probably not what you thought on your roof. Um, unfortunately, these things happen the best way to get around this and move forward from here is, is this. and Do the fault find and see what you can do to fix it, is it? Yeah, exactly. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm. Just try and look after them as best you can. But it happens a lot. Very disappointing in our industry, really, that you still got those damn cowboys in there. I don't know if it's more – I feel like it happens more in this industry than anywhere. And, and I don't know that that's the case because if you ask somebody in a different industry, they might say the same thing. But I haven't come across – a topic that comes up as often if you're just amongst friends, family, or at a gathering with people that are not industry related, mm. everyone's got a story about a friend or themselves that has been either ripped off or hard done by or had a solar system. Everybody knows someone. Mm. Mm. So I feel like it's probably comes back to that low barrier to entry to this industry. It's very easy for someone to become a solar company. All you need is a mobile phone. <laughs> and really, that's it. Oh, a bit of a – no, you need a, um, a trailer. Not even, though. They, you just subcontract <laughs> the work out and don't care who you subcontract it out to. It's pretty easy. If you really want to do it that way, you can start a solar company very, very easily. I do have a solution. And in Victoria, for example, they now have mandatory inspection on every system. Yeah, we install that, yeah. With quality installers. Uh, sorry, with quality inspectors. Yeah. And that does weed out some of the cost cutting. It does. I think it's it's a, it's a good and bad. I think if it's done correctly, it's very good. And um, it, it's probably getting into the weeds a little bit too much. But um, the way it's done in Victoria, 
can be a little bit prohibitive in terms of time frames and stuff. But you're right. That, I mean, having some kind of audit process in place would obviously increase yeah. quality control. As long as bureaucracy doesn't take over to the point that everything is gone dead and slowed down and you wait months for somebody to sign off on it and you can't turn it on for three months, yes, of course. Exactly. You, you've got to have the right number of inspectors available to service the industry. Yeah. But if you have an independent party afterwards come through to audit it, yeah. it does weed out a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Or alternatively, you pick a company that has been around for a while. Yeah. That doesn't sell it to you for one ninety nine. Yeah. And doesn't focus all on price, and basically talks about the after sales service, the long journey together. Because yeah. Because what you do not want is what I call a puzzle solar system, mm. where four different companies tweaked on it over its emergence. Yeah. And it's still not working properly. Yeah. You want one company one with quality control to do the system properly and plan that system already for the future. Yes, 100%. When you compare Australia to other countries like the UK and all that, because of our sunshine and maybe because we still have people who want to work hard, are we maybe luckier with solar and batteries than other countries? Definitely. And the proof's in the pudding. In some areas, one in three rooftop now have, have solar energy on. Mm. So we are, we're blessed with the correct climate. And although we could probably say there's some negatives in the way governments do things, they've been very supportive of small scale solar systems mm. here. Mm. We're still getting STC rebates that cover a significant <clears throat> portion of the cost of your solar system. I don't believe you get that in New Zealand or you don't get it in England. So not only do we have the perfect climate, but we do have a supportive government with the STC rebate which is paying for a significant portion of your solar system. Mm. The return on investment is phenomenal. I don't know if you know your audience is um, invest in other things or not, but if you can get a 20% return on a very secure investment, that's phenomenal. And that's what solar gives you. And you don't have to be Warren Buffett to pick it. You don't have to value a company. <laughs> you don't have to take a risk like that. You just have to make sure that you're installing it properly and, and, and paying for a good quality install. And you will get those returns. I've worked out 30 grand is uh, what's in your pocket over the 20 years out of electricity bills if you go with a decent sized solar system as a minimum. Yeah. And then if you're looking at commercial... I mean, we have return on investments with commercial systems. Once you look at different things other than just size of solar system, so we might tweak some tariffs, we might look at restructuring some things on a retailer side, power factor correction, a few other things that can be done pre-solar install, we can get return on investments 1.8 years at some times. Um, in fact, if you're doing... Um, that's that's amazing. It's phenomenal. And you just have to be a little bit smarter how you structure it. But there are a couple of things, which is basically the company either has to have a really good relationship with the owner of the building or own the building. Yep. They also suppose want to be there at least for the next five, six, seven, eight years. So there has to be a bit of long term. Mm. And also they want to use electricity a lot during the day. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's fair. And um, not everybody fits that. But mm. the ones that do... If you're not doing solar energy here as a business owner that ticks those boxes, I think there's something wrong because there's no we can structure it so there's no upfront costs. And I don't just mean no interest ever payment plans. Mm -hmm. You can do a, a PPA where it literally will cost you nothing. Power purchase agreement. Power purchase mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. Your maintenance is all built in. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong with your solar system, you're not charged because it's not producing energy. Where do you install all around Australia commercial? Um, not quite, no, but we mostly, yeah, yeah. There's some areas we can't. So, if get you're to. an owner that has a business that falls in the category we've just mentioned, mm. look up GI Energy. Yeah, there's ways we can do it. I used to say to people, if I can't prove you this will cost nothing, I'll buy you a slab of beer. Uh, uh, <laughs> nothing, I mean, uh, nothing, I mean, you will charge him still something, aren't you? Sorry, what that should, what I should have said was if, if this won't. If it will cost you less than what you're currently paying That's for your it. power bill. Mm. That's how I used to say it to people. If, if I can't show you this will cost you less than what you're currently paying on your power bill, I'll buy you a slab of beer. And it doesn't have to. Mm. It can be a much lower rate per kilowatt hour with zero risk because you're not paying if it doesn't work. You're paying per kilowatt hour now mm. and you're paying the retailer X amount mm. then you're paying the PPA less. Yeah, And yeah. you can even put things in place that say, if that retailer rate drops below your PPA rate, we will guarantee that we'll drop it by 10%. Mm. It's now, if you're a business owner and all of this confused you, 
in simple words, Dan saying, if you have electricity, you pay the normal price to the retailer. With solar, he can save you. And according to him, it's not just a little bit, it's a bloody lot. Is that about it in Correct. summary? Yeah. Because, you know, most people get confused. As soon as you say PPA, yeah. they might think you're talking about some kind of medical equipment, you know. Yeah. So, so, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just want to simplify it really that um, – there's power purchase agreement, which means that the solar system gets actually supplied by the company with finance attached, and then you pay only every time you use the electricity and you have a lower rate than what you normally pay. Correct. You just pay for the power that's generated from your solar system mm. and you pay less for that power from your solar system than you do for the grid power. Yeah. Look, I really learned a lot today. I like your passion. I like your honesty. And so I would say if people in Brisbane looking for solar, GI Energy and Dan's the man. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry for being a little bit corny at the end. <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Cheers. Hi, guys. We've had Dan from GI Energy earlier and today now we've got Matt Williams. Matt, I think, is kind of what? You look after the day-to-day -day running of the company? A lot of that, yes. So I guess the... Um yeah, the operations, um, the sales guys that are in the office as well. Mm. So I still like to speak to a lot of clients myself and um, keep my finger on the pulse. I have a huge passion for solar and right. um, obviously learning everything and there is that constantly evolving. So mm. definitely mm. one of those topics that week to week, there's something that changes that mm. you want to keep mm. your finger mm. on the pulse mm. for sure. There are some people who still look at roofs and wonder, does mm. solar really save me money? Look, I guess we occasionally get asked that question. Um, I'd say that's changed massively, I guess, from a previous question as well. Maybe 10 years ago, you'd speak to a client, it might be 50-50 that they purchase solar, whereas almost certainly now I'd say 9 out of 10 um, customers that inquire with us will either purchase solar from us or somebody else. So absolutely, it saves you money. The, the, what we pay for power has increased over the past few years. Markley and like in Southeast Queensland, 30, 40% for, for a lot of people. We're obviously always blessed with quite, quite cheap rates for power compared to other places in the country. So I, I guess that question gets banded around a little bit because of reduced feed-in tariffs. That tends to be what it's associated with. And obviously some of the other things going on in the media at the moment with sort of a sun tax or something else. We won't get into that, Marcus. I know you like to talk about that <laughs> somewhere else, but... Solar absolutely saves you money because we're probably using more power than we were previously. So whether that be hot water, heating, cooling, pool, EV, obviously electric vehicles coming into the mix now. So where you may not see a huge saving on the feed-in tariff side, it's all about how you consume your power. So for us, a huge thing that we want to do is educate our clients into self-consumption. So whether that be with um, monitoring and, and diversion tools, something like that, or storage, your return on solar could be three or four years with with quality solar. We're not we're not talking like cheap, off the shelf cookie cutter systems. Like this is systems that are built to last for twenty twenty five years. If you're getting a twenty five percent return on your investment, there's there's nowhere else that you can find that realistically. And if you can reach out to us, either just give us a call about that. We don't need to talk about solar. So if there is that, we're always happy to hear it. But I think more so than ever, solar can save us money. It's just about having a company to educate you on how to use it correctly because mm. so many people have it now, but I still find they don't have the knowledge of how to get the best out of it. You speak to people at, you know what I mean, at a barbecue or at the gym or something like that, that have soda that tell you that, oh, I don't think it's working for me or maybe it's not saving me enough money. And what I tend to find is that they've just never been educated on to how to use their, their power properly. Their, their hot water is still on a controlled load tariff or they're running their dishwasher at night or something like that, something that could be so minor. Pool pump. Pool pump, yeah, exa exactly. Run so it, Run it at night when you should run it during the day when your solar is operating. 100%. Any other power that you generate that you can consume yourself is four, five, six times more valuable than what it is going back into the grid. Mm. So if you can understand that and if you can educate people in how to get the best out of the system, they save more money, they're happier, mm. and their return's excellent. Mm. Mm. Nowadays, you probably get customers in who weigh up, should I get solar or should I get solar and a battery at the same time? What's your advice? 
Um, that's a great question. And that's, that probably is one of the main questions that our clients ask us. And I guess, it, look, it, it would be depending on how they use their power, what uses that power and when it's used. Because if you're a retired person and you're home in the day and you're able to do all your washing and your heating and your cooling in the day, in that instance, solar only is going to save a huge amount of money. If you're out all day and you come home at five o'clock, the aircon goes on, the oven goes on, you charge your car, whatever else it may be, and all your power is used at night, obviously quite a generic example there, but then obviously there's there's value to be had in the, in the battery mm -hmm. as, as well. So it may be there. We just want to understand what our clients' needs are. So just taking the time to ask them, what, what are they thinking of a battery? Is it for self-consumption, saving money? Is it for power outages? Mm. That's been a huge topic, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously with weather that we've had over the past sort of six to 12 months. Mm. So mm. if you're dealing with the right company that you're speaking to that actually understands and you're able to take the time to understand what their needs are and how they use their power, we can give you that, that advice to say, okay, maybe just start with solar for now. Let's understand how you use your power. You've got full monitoring with your system. Mm. So we can then see, okay, you're generating this much power. You're, this is how much you're consuming day and night. And then present the value proposition of, okay, if we add a battery into the mix after 12 months, so go winter and summer, obviously varying output in terms of solar generation, then we can, okay, so this is what a battery will actually do for you. Mm. Um, but really, it's all about, for, for us, I think it's under, understanding your client's needs, asking the right questions to see what they want to what, what they want to do, because I think there's still a bit of a misconception on, on how solar will work. Some people are waiting for storage to actually think until storage is whatever price it needs to be for them, they'll hold off on solar. Mm. Whereas in that interim time, solar could have saved them a fortune mm. because they mm. can offset their pool pump, mm. their hot water. They can cool their house down, pre-cool it down while they're at work, whatever else it may be. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just about understanding what the pros and cons of each option are. And ultimately, the budget that the, the client has assigned for it as well. Obviously, the storage will add a little bit more mm. to, to the overall equation. But the benefit could be huge there mm. from having storage with the system. So we we don't actively push batteries or storage on um, on our clients or anybody else. We just want to understand what the right solution is for them because we tailor each system mm. to, to mm. our clients. Mm. 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 I actually have a slightly different perspective and I'd be interested to see what you think. I believe pretty well from now on, if I would go in and advise a customer, other than somebody who's really on a very tight budget, I would argue get a solar battery right now. The technology is there. It's mature. Mm -hmm. You will save with a solar battery. Yes, it might take you one or two years longer to get your money back, but your comfort level is straight away increased because you've got your blackout protection. Yeah. You might buy an EV in a few years' time. You've got the battery there to help charge the EV. Doesn't the battery and solar really make a lot of sense straight away now? It does make a lot of sense, absolutely. And <clears throat> I can certainly see the way that you're – you're, you're thinking about that. And I think from within the industry, I agree with most of that, <laughs> what you said there. Um, I still would bring it back to what the client is requesting. So we would still introduce the option of storage into the conversation, even if solar is, the, is, is their thought, their initial thought mm -hmm. for, okay, I'm going to install a 10 kilowatt system, whatever it may be that they, that they come into it before actually understanding what they, what they need. Mm -hmm. So everything that you've said in terms of, yeah, it gives you that blackout protection. It gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling that you can look at your app at 7 p.m. or 5 p.m. in Brisbane because it gets dark early and see, okay, I'm now running off off my battery only. I'm pulling no power from the grid. It, it's it's quite a... And it's still your own battery. Uh, it's still your power, yeah. It's still your power you generate during the day out of your system. So you're not selling it for peanuts to the energy retailer to make them rich. Absolutely. It's Look, it, it's quite a... It's quite an uplifting feeling to see. I, look, I have storage at home mm. and I love having battery storage. So where possible, yes, I completely agree with what you're saying. However, I, I think... You're, you're too ethical salesperson I think, to basically yeah. say everybody should have it, which is actually giving GI Energy another credit because you're really saying 
we'll give you this bespoke solution. We're not going to try and ram one solution down your throat. It's actually the right answer. Thank but you. I just <laughs> no, I, I, and look, there's, there's a lot of what you said as, uh, that I agree with. I think the key for us really would just be ensuring that you have a system that can at least add a battery mm. at the very least and that you have a system large enough because I think this gets missed massively as well. You have a system large enough to generate what you need and fill a battery. Mm. And wait, look, that may not be possible seasonally mm. or on a weekend compared to the weekday, but to have a few extra panels, to have that ability to generate a little bit more power, whether that be for storage, could be for an electric vehicle, we're only going to continue to use more power. So mm. our advice would always be, look, do, do it right, do it once. If you're able to get a little bit of a larger system, I've never, ever known anyone say, I wish I'd get less solar. Mm. But we do get some phone calls to say, can I add more solar? And it's not always that simple because mm. most likely they've maxed out the inverter for STCs, for potentially obviously the parameters of the inverter as well, or they've run out of roof space. So I would always say, look, fill the usable roof space with the budget that you have available. Mm. And look, if a battery can squeeze into there as well, why not? Because yeah, the return is is excellent now. And there's other ways that you can obviously supplement that too, that, that are obviously mm, becoming mm, more mm, mainstream. Mm, mm, mm. Um, plus you get the blackout protection. Like, I guess a, a quick story there. I had a client over <clears throat> over the uh, over the Christmas break um, that was in Tambourine. So a little bit rural, maybe like 40 minutes out from the Gold Coast. And um, there was a storm that went through on Christmas night to Boxing Day. Real one of the craziest thunderstorms, I've lived here for 15 years and one of the craziest thunderstorms I, I can recall. And um, this particular home was without power for three weeks. <sighs> yep. Luckily, <laughs> prior to that, we'd installed a, um, a 15 kilowatt system, Fronia Simo Gen 24 inverter with two full stacks of BYD storage. So 44 kilowatt hours of storage. And um, I got a message from this gentleman on Boxing Day to say, hey mate, Merry Christmas. Power went out yesterday, as you probably assume. Just so you know, I've got my aircon running. Have a look at my monitoring when you get a chance. Really, really good guy. Like I spoke to him many times since the installation. And um, three week, come three weeks later, obviously we had a <clears throat> had a break for Christmas, as as um, as anyone would have. Come back into work, the power's still out. So in that area, um, a lot of the lines were down. So obviously Energex were coming around to to fix everything. And I was going on his monitoring, and I was just like, this guy is just using power as if it's normal, normal operation. So he's still obviously able to generate 50, 60, 70 kilowatt hours because he's got a large solar array, but he's running his air con, he's running whatever else that he plans to do and um, come back to being in the office and I give him a call and he's just over the moon that he did this because from the outset, 44 kilowatt hours of storage is it's large. <laughs> Some may say excessive, but he had prepped with this in mind because of where he lives and ultimately that then became to him invaluable mm. and it may be and it is obviously a decent upfront investment but for him in that instance to put the price on having the ability to have no power but still run aircon it's pretty uh it was pretty it's pretty cool yeah, I'm sure he re reported on it on his Facebook. <laughs> well, he, he he actually only just left us a, re a review the other day, so I'm not sure why it took <laughs> took six months. So I'll have to follow that one up. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. Now, um, there are some customers who've gone for solar. They got a one and a half kilowatt system, maybe three, four, and they might ring up and ask, um, "Can I put a battery to it? Do I upgrade?" Sometimes the system was plonked right in the middle of the roof in the best possible spot. Yep. What do you advise to customers that have an older style solar system? I guess, look, initially we want to understand how that system's operating. So there probably wouldn't be monitoring on a system of 10, year, um, 10 years of age or, or more. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those systems, particularly in Queensland, may be on the legacy feed-in tariff as well. So if they're installed up to sort of mid-2012, they, they'd still be receiving 44 cent feed-in plus their retailer feeding. So initially we want to understand if the system's still operating. So more often than not, what I would say, you tend to find in that it, it may not be operating. There's an issue with the inverter or the panel or, or possibly the installation. 
So again, we'd want to understand the reason for the potential adjustment of system size or, or addition of storage firstly, then understand how that system is operating because if they're, if they're looking to add storage, it's very unlikely they'd have sufficient excess power to fill that battery, particularly if you're doing a retrofit in our case of a Tesla. So Tesla powers 13 and a half kilowatt hours of, and if you've got a 1.5 or a two or even a three, you'd be lucky to produce 13 and a half kilowatt hours in total, let alone what you've then consumed so if you've got your hot water, your pool, whatever else may be in your home, your air con, very unlikely you've got anything left to fill a battery firstly. So it's then about having that conversation to understand, okay, you've got a three kilowatt system, just as an example, you're feeding in two kilowatt hours a day. Yes, you might be on the legacy feeding tariff, mm, mm. but now you're, you're using 40, you're purchasing 40 from the grid. Mm. So 40 kilowatt hours a day, if you then put on a much larger system with storage, it's tailored then to what, how you use your power now. So again, I'll just bring it back to understanding what they what their goal is here. Um, Let's say I want to show, uh, yeah, my electricity bill ha actually has gone up because yep. I've got more consumption and I just want it to go down. So do I rip the old system off? Do I leave it? Do I add extra? Do I need a second system? Can I upgrade the existing system? Look, <laughs> there's many ways that you can do it. I would say... Ultimately, it nearly always ends in a new system, realistically, because that system is in excess of 10 years old. Either the inverter isn't made anymore, the manufacturer is not around, or the warranty's obviously ceased. Mm. The panels may be 190, 200 watts, 230 watts, which now obviously we're talking about double that mm. power class. So in terms of power class per square meter of roof space, obviously now we can fit on a much larger system. So they're safer too, the new ones, isn't it? They got uh, the panels have more fire retardant, uh, the cables are more safely installed. So, newer systems that are safer than the very old ones. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, things have changed massively in that time. Mm. Um, I guess, look, I'll, I'll give you my own example. When I moved into the home that we live in in 2017, there was an old 1.5, uh, there was an Aero Sharp inverter on the wall that was um, just. DC cable just in the roof space, no conduit, anything else. So obviously, look, that thing came out. I put a six and a half kilowatt system in at the time. Pretty quickly realized I'd need more as we were obviously doing other bits and pieces to the home and I've put a second system on. We're now seven years later. I'm thinking about taking off the six kilowatt system because we've got storage, we've got an EV, we've put in ducted air con, so heating and cooling. I'm now even thinking, is that six kilowatt system worth Mm. taken off because I can fit another 10, 11 kilowatts in its place. And that's with some great gear. Like I've got obviously pretty picky with what I'd put on my own roof, just like what we install. So if I'm doing that experiment myself, even with a six kilowatt system, when we do it with a a 1.5 or a two or a three or whatever it may be, it's it's almost certainly worthwhile starting fresh because there'd be some point of that initial existing installation that isn't up to current standards the warranty probably isn't in place and it now makes financial sense to, to start fresh and look I'm not a fan of taking off systems that are working absolutely not but if there's a way of obviously prov providing a, a benefit to that end user where they can save money and that's what they want to do why not so upgrading is actually making up for a lost opportunity absolutely yeah 100 mm. percent because the initial system that you may have that's three kilowatts, it might only be at 70, 80% of its original efficiency anyway. Panel have degraded. <clears throat> Absolutely. Or, Panels yeah. have degraded over time, cables, inverter efficiencies, and obviously the n newer panels are far more efficient now. Mm. So No monitor options. No monitoring as well. So half the time you don't even know how that system's going. <laughs> All you've got to go off is a screen that's faded, <laughs> and then you're looking at a power bill for, okay, they've sent back X amount of kilowatt hours. I did, I did this for a neighbor, a, a elderly neighbor of mine a couple of weeks ago as well. I've got too many personal stories here, but <laughs> she was trying to understand how it's working and she'd paid for someone to, she didn't know that I did, did solar and she'd paid for someone to come out and they told her to clean her panels. And obviously the next bill came, nothing had changed. It's just an old system. That's mm. all that, that, that's all it is. Panels do deteriorate, especially the older ones. So sometimes your system is just now 
fudging about at 30%, 40% capacity and there's nothing you can do to revitalize it. Absolutely. I guess like anything that like <clears throat> with air cons as well, like obviously people are replacing their air cons after mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years. We're now in that space of solar in that next, you know what I mean, the solar coaster, whatever, mm -hmm. 2.0, 3.0 version yeah. we are at now, yeah. 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 where we're obviously just moving into the next phase. Mm. I've heard the term solar shark and solar cowboy. Um, are they pretty movies? <laughs> I don't know what movies you like to watch, Marcus, but I, I don't think they're very pretty. <laughs> um, yeah, there's obviously a, uh, yeah, those terms get banded around in this industry, unfortunately, and there are some solar sharks and cowboys that still operate, probably as prevalent as any time in this industry. Um, what are we looking for? An old pensioner that lives by himself that I can tell stories? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I think there's obviously a certain demographic of society that can be preyed upon by those types of people. And we, fortunately, sometimes we get calls into the office where they've actually had the due diligence and the time to think, okay, I might just get a second opinion here. And because we've done this for so long, and with some of the brands that we use, when they search those brands or they're in that area, they find us. And um, yeah, some of the pricing and some of the things that you see is just appalling. So so you get sometimes really cheap gear sold at very high margins. Yes. And then you get cheap gear sold cheaply and installed cheaply. And both of those solutions are really not serving the customer. 100%. I, I, I don't know what's worse, to be honest, because... I'm assuming solar sharks, you mean the high price cheap <laughs> and the cowboys, you just mean cheap, cheap. Yeah. Okay. So just to, yeah. All right. So maybe the solar sharks actually, because <clears throat> they're worse than the cowboys. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's a pretty hard one, isn't it? Which one you want to, which one you want to, yeah. Um, but when they overprice really, really low, low end gear, I think that's what really gets my backup still after doing this for so long, because as I said before, it, it tends to be. A, a certain demographic that would be preyed upon for that because they mm. think they're an easy target or whatever it may be. And it can be in metro areas, but also can be in those rural areas where they just roll through, door knock, mm. telemarket, just hit and run. So to overprice something and promise the world and not deliver, that's pretty, it's pretty enraging, to be honest. And I think that's getting slightly less prevalent, I would say, because obviously now... There's so much information out there. Mm. It's obviously sold under high pressure tactics that could force people to make a very fast decision without taking that time to obviously look at the company and the history. So it definitely still happens. And we probably get a, a call a week or a fortnight from someone getting that second opinion, which is great when you can obviously save them. What tends to happen with that though, is then they're just not trusting of anyone because obviously if you explain the situation of what's occurred, you provide a fair price, and then they just are just all over the place, which is understandable as well when, when that's occurred. Whereas the cowboys at the other end of the industry have obviously been prevalent for many, many years, and Australia has an insatiable appetite for cheap solar. There's so much of it in this industry. Everyone knows somebody that's purchased a solar system, be it a friend or a neighbour or a colleague, where they haven't got what they thought they would out of the system, what they were promised, they thought they were buying German Munsterland or Hanover panels, all those old brands that you no doubt remember as well. And it was just a very, very cheap Chinese panel. And that's not to align any view on, there's some great products from China, awesome mm. products. A mm. lot of the ones that we install are made in China. But just be honest about where they're from. There's no reason to, mm. to, to make that up because half the things that we purchase come from there. And it's, again, I use the word enraging for the solar sharks. Maybe that's appropriate for the, for the cowboys too. It, but. it is because I've got a brother-in-law who's always a bargain hunter and he sends me these quotes and I look at the company and they've been resurfacing three times and I then point it out to him and I go, no, you can't get a good solar system for $2,999. Mm. It's just not available. Three months later, oh, so, look, <laughs> look at this offer now. I've checked the company out. They got really, really good reviews. Yes, they have 699 five-star review, mm. not a single four-star. Did you think they maybe purchased them out of India and they're all fake? 
and you kind of so I kind of he he's still in this eternal hope mm. that one day he'll find a 2,999 <laughs> how, how many years has this been going on for? Oh, about four years. And, <laughs> maybe this... and, and, and I've actually <laughs> recommended good quality companies to him yeah. and, and maybe the price is around five or six, you yeah. know, but he gets good gear, gets a good company and this and that. Yeah. And all these years that he's now bargain hunting, he, he just, could have had solar. And he just saved that money anyway. Yeah, and yeah. I, and I shouldn't have even said to my brother-in-law, but <laughs> Jesus, he drives me nuts. Well, hopefully he's not listening to this. <laughs> but I, my advice would be if you pay the right amount for solar from a reputable company that's been around a long time, that, that should be the first thing that you look at, the company hmm. and how they do things. Because, yeah, if you find a solar cowboy, they'll definitely be cheaper than a quality retailer in the area. But there's a reason for that, and you've just got to scratch the surface a little bit more. And as you said, you see those 699 or however many thousand positive reviews, there has to be a, a negative review. Every company, even the best company in the world would have a negative review. Mm. And really, that's what I personally think is how you weed companies out, because mm. there's always going to be little hiccups and little issues. But really, that's where you can find out the true ethos of that company yeah. with how yeah. they fix things or how they even just reading the response to that review as well. If it's a cheap company, there's two options. No negative review, mm. which is a red flag, or check out the negative reviews and the low stars because they are most probably the most honest ones. Absolutely. Um, mm. I mean, mm. it's pretty easy to, to, to buy and purchase those reviews now or offer an incentive to a client to, to, to leave a review. Mm. It's, it's mm. a very common thing not just in solar, but in any industry. Mm -hmm. So it's just you do your research, absolutely. Right. What about the warranties? How valid are they? They're very long in solar now. They're probably getting a little bit unrealistic, I, I would I would say. Some are putting some pretty irresponsible warranties out there. I so, mean, if somebody offers 40-year warranty on a solar panel, quite yeah. frankly, the technology by then will be changed. I, I mean, 20, 25 years, I think, is realistic and max or do i care what's happening in 40 years yeah i think look 25 years on the panel is is obviously commonplace now um that's really anything over and above that i i think is a little bit excessive as, as you mentioned mm. so you've got to from from the customer's mind the panels are sitting on the roof they're sitting on the roof in the sun the rain everything else that's going on up there so they will deteriorate over time slightly mm. so in 40 years time what we place on our homes to create energy for us is going to be very different than what we create in 2024. So taking to one side the number of years that the warranties may have, for us more than anything else, it's about how long that manufacturer has been in business to make sure that they will honour the warranty. How many staff they got in Australia? What after-sales services they go? What has been the panel's performance or the inverter's performance in the field? These are all the things, aren't they? Yeah, all, all of those things. So, how yeah, how stringently they've tested the panel. Have mm. they tested it in real-life conditions, not just in the lab where they've taken the shrink wrapping <laughs> off, <laughs> shine a light on it, okay, it works great. That's, five, that's, five, that's The last five minutes, it worked really great. Exactly. <laughs> Look, that, that's fantastic, and that's five minutes, and we're talking about 20 years, 25 years in one of, if not the most extreme environments in, in the world. You get a lot of corrosion type stuff in the Brisbane uh, Gold Coast area, don't you? I mean, salt corrosion in the air, etc. So you would need the panel tested against that. Absolutely. So yeah, if you're obviously closer to the water, that's really important. And um, obviously, yeah, we'd recommend the correct panel in that installation mm. um, as well. So yeah, as you mentioned, having a base in Australia, so there's a head office that you can call. There's mm. somebody that you can speak to the number of staff that are there, their track record as well for obviously assisting ourselves, other installers um, that we speak to and just understanding what that process looks like because you could have an, an issue with a number of inverters and what they offer you obviously as, a, as an RMA or a, or a cost to go and fix that inverter probably doesn't cover the labor cost even just to drive there, let mm. alone to go there twice do a full report, a review, whatever they're asking for to obviously perform that that warranty claim. So in the first place, you really want a gear that doesn't have the warranty claim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, look, that's the ideal. So if, if there's a dream scenario, of course. So mm. picking a product with a really low failure rate 
strong strong base in Australia is the key. Nobody wants to be calling overseas to, to fix a problem. You want to be focusing on quality, reputable gear that stood the test of time. And for us, that's why we've chosen the products we have. Mm. And look, we're not assigned to just one particular inverter, one particular panel, one particular battery. We've got a few there because we obviously have different requirements. But we're not just going to pick out the cheapest inverter because it's a thousand dollars cheaper and we might make a few more sales you've got a few more liabilities there no long term it's probably actually costing you but um you using rec panels for example what do you like about them rec um we do use quite a few rec panels look obviously they've been around a long time made in singapore very um very good track record in terms of their failure rates incredibly low so I guess bringing it back to that initially, large company, they've been testing panels extensively in Australia for many years as well. And the Alpha panel, which is their flagship panel that, that they've obviously been running for quite a while now, mm -hmm. the performance in that monitoring data that we have is exceptional. So, so it actually gets on the same size roof more bang for buck. You get more output because it's got a higher efficiency. Correct. Yeah. So they have, they have a couple of different models. So if you have their higher power class model, obviously that would do it from there. But because the panel is so efficient mm. and it's warranted at 92% for, for its um, performance guarantee. After 25 After years. After 25 years. Wow. So that degradation per annum is so low. So I don't think Dan mentioned before he's got REC panels on his house. <laughs> I've got a I've got a brand that I, I think I may have briefly uh, suggested no longer services the market here, which is of we're, we're always of perceived um, equivalent quality, let's say. But at the moment, REC is if somebody asks us for the absolute best panel quality, that's what we provide. Mm. Mm. You do a Trina panel too, do you? What do you like about them? I personally love Trina. Trina have been around for, what, 28 years at the time of recording this this conversation. I think bang for buck, there's nothing that touches Trina. They've been testing panels in Australia since 2009. They they look good. The performance is exceptional. Again, bringing it back to, because we have this the beauty of this monitoring data, we can see how they perform. So if we install a Trina panel versus XYZ panel in the same suburb, same orientation, we can actually see how, how the performance is. So I think... Given their time in the industry over here and some of their some of the people that actually install that panel, so some of the large clients that do their due diligence and choose Trina. Um, they get used a lot of uh, large commercials too, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So mm. a couple of big brands, I don't know if you can name names, but <laughs> there's, quite a, uh, there's quite a lot of very, very well-known uh, brands that install Trina. So they've obviously done their due diligence as well. Mm. So for us, that speaks volumes, but... It's just a really, really well-performing panel at a great price. So if someone is inquiring and value for money is really important to them, mm. that's the panel that we, nine times out of 10, will end up putting on their roof. So you want to go with GI Energy, want a good panel, but also looking in your back pocket? You say Trina. <laughs> I say Trina. Yeah, absolutely. So I would go a Fronius inverter, mm. Trina panels, um, maybe a battery. I think, I think I think if we go with Trina panels, we could possibly can afford a battery. <laughs> there you go. You've got the generation. Get a get a get a thirteen kilowatt system on there, so you're generating plenty of power. Mm. And um, yeah, then you've got space to fill a battery as well. Well, look in summer, really. If you in Brisbane, you're very lucky in the first place because you get a lot of good sunlight. You're also quite lucky because you've got Geo Energy there, who've been there since 2011, installed literally thousands of systems convinced me today that after sales is their one priority and you've got a very nice looking and friendly team that's managing it. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming, Thanks, Matt. Martin. Want more Energy Answered? Visit yourenergyanswers.com for quality energy products, tools and calculators and find your quality local installers. Please support the channel by liking the video, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and check out all our other videos. You're still here? I'll see you next time. Bye.